exist. For example,
Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so today we're gonna kind of do a, a little bit of a bonus session. In fact, in the next, the, the rest of the semester, we'll, we'll probably have some, some bonus sessions on, on Friday. And this really has nothing necessarily to do with your first paper that's, that's due on Sunday. So remember that if you have questions, feel free to uh, send me an email or, or to text me and I'll, I'll, I'll um, answer any, any of your questions. But t today's class is kind of just a bonus session that I want to kind of give you a preview of some things that we might talk about in the 1102 class. And today, what we're going to talk about is uh, a, a guy who, who teaches, or actually, I think he's retired at this point, but he taught at Arizona State University, and his name is Robert Cialdini. And he wrote a book. There are different versions of it. I mean, you can like look at it in the 1980s, and there might be an updated version in the 87 and in the 1990s and then even in the 2000s but his book is called influence and what he's really concerned with is how people commit to making a decision now this book is talked about in the advertising fields and like marketing advertising things like that but actually Cialdini is more interested in psychology and how do people make decisions, essentially. So he, he, he has a background in psychology. He, he looked at like, like how people make decisions, whether they like in, in terms of their voting or in terms of how they just make a decision walking into a supermarket and buying grocery how do they make decisions? And that's what he's mostly interested in. And these are some of the concepts, we're not gonna get through all of them today. Again, we'll, we'll, we'll save this for another bonus session. Well, I'll get to the last few of these examples, uh, maybe in a different Friday. And uh, by the way, I, I, I would like to have these bonus sessions, if, if you will maybe on Fridays, and of course, I'll, I'll, I'll save them. I know that some, some people that already emailed me and said that they were gonna be in class today. Well, that, that's okay, I'll, I'll definitely save these uh, so you can check them out later a little bit. But these, what you see here on the screen, these are the main concepts that we'll go over, not all today, but we'll go over in some of the other um, bonus sessions that we'll have maybe on, on Fridays. I, I, I think that this is awesome, awesome that if we can have like bonus sessions on Fridays, but the main thing to keep in mind here is what you see here on the left, uh, because this is what Cialdini says. It's like, this is not a rocket science. These are main psychological reactions that people have instinctively. So it's, it's not necessarily a uh, conscience or that they're trying to do these things. These are involuntary reactions that we have. And it's, so it's not rocket science. So what you see here at the bottom, these are easy principles to understand but the key is to remember to use them because unfortunately a lot of people don't necessarily remember them so these are just some of the concepts that you see here in the bullet points here i mean we'll, we'll talk about commitment and consistency reciprocity the concept of a rejection retreat which is something that a lot of people always forget about uh, social proof, liking, authority, uh, scarcity, trigger feature, and contrast principle. So once again, though, just to emphasize, these are psychological reactions that people have. It's just human nature. But the problem is that pe um, a lot of people going into the business world forget to, to use them. So before going on, 
let me just uh, emphasize these. Um, before we start this, this lecture, and I'll, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm going to end this a little bit early because it looks like there, the, nobody's on here necessarily. Uh, but we'll, we'll save that for, 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 for next week. But, and I know that a lot of people are in class right now, and, and this is just kind of a bonus extra uh, material that you don't have to, to watch necessarily. So, before we start this little mini lecture here, Robert Cialdini asks these seven basic questions, and some of these will just blow your mind in, in terms of how profound they actually are when you get into the psychological details. So he asks, number one, is it better to tell new prospects what they stand to gain by moving in your direction or what they stand to lose if they don't? Number two, if you have a new piece of information, when should you mention that it's new, before or after you present the information? Number three, if you have two options to present to a client, should you first ask for the more costly or the less costly? Number four, if you have a product or service with both strengths and weaknesses, when should you present the weaknesses, early or late? And once again, this presentation, I'll, I'll get into that. It's, uh, it's actually a re really uh, startling when you look at the evidence about that. Uh, number five, after someone has praised your product, what is the most effective thing that you can do immediately after you say thank you. And that number six, why do businesses intentionally undersupply their products? The answer to this is, is once again fascinating. I've actually had students that have worked for Best Buy and they tell me that this is absolutely true. Best Buy or businesses like Best Buy will intentionally undersupply their products, especially around the holidays. And uh, I mean, the reasons that we'll get into it, it, it are really, really fascinating. So we'll talk about that. It, it, I mean, from a business perspective, it makes no sense. Why would you completely undersupply your products? It, it, I mean, it makes no sense but there's a specific psychological reason why they do that. So that we'll get into that. And then number seven, for someone to like you and cooperate with you, what are the most productive things you can do to influence that person immediately, like right off the bat? Like what, what are the most important things that you can do to have somebody uh, come up to you and immediately want to co cooperate with you. So we'll get into these seven questions. So one of the things just to start off with is that Cialdini did, well, he actually cites, but, but, and by the way, Cialdini, not only does he do, do test experiments with his own students, or he did, I, I think he's retired at this point, but he not only did test experiments with his own students, he also did a lot of research into all of these different studies. So one of the studies that he, he talks about is the famous Xerox machine study. And it's a little bit different now, nowadays, because everybody has a, a, a computer and, and a fax a machine and everybody can can print out copies uh, whenever you want but in the 1970s it wasn't always like that so Cialdini cites a study from 1978 where these people went into a line with, with the 
you know, the latest fax machine, the latest Xerox machine. And they were all waiting in line to try to get copies of, of whatever they, they were trying to print, right? So kind of an interesting study that psychologists did is that they went up to people and they did, just did kind of a, a, like a basic experiment. And they said that, hey, if you want to cut in line for this print, for, the, for this fax, whatever it might be, what are the chances that people would allow others to just cut in line? And it's kind of interesting when I show this in, in class, people say like, oh, well, if you just go in line, and don't think of this as, as just like a, a, like a, a print or a fax machine or anything like that. But just imagine if you, if you go to a fast food joint, joint right now and you just say, hey, can I cut in line? What do you think the chances of people would allow you to cut in line? Probably very little, people would say. And when they did this the first time, they would have, okay, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the copy machine? Actually, 60% of people let the person cut in line. Now, I think it's, it's probably different in 2020. I don't think that people are necessarily that nice. But 60% of people at that time said, hey, oh, oh, okay, I'll let you cut in line. And all the person had to do is say, hey, excuse me, I have five pages, may, may I use the copy machine? And 60% of people said that, okay, I'll let you cut in line. And then the next example is when people said, hey, excuse me, I have five pages, may I use the copy machine because I'm in a rush? So the results were 94%. Again, 2020, it might not be that easy to, to cut in line necessarily, but in these days, at the 1990s, people said that, okay, you have five pages and you have to use the copy machine. I'll let you cut in line. But the third result here that you see is the most interesting to psychologists because the answer was, excuse me, I have five pages. May I use the copy machine because I have to make some copies? Well, you think about it. Of course, <laughs> you're trying to cut in line. Of course, you have to make copies. Uh, we all understand that. But the key word, though, is in the language. It's the word because. Just because somebody had a reason because I said the word because, that kind of changes the whole process uh, mentally and, and psychologically because if people say that they have to, to make a copy because, it, it doesn't even matter what, what the reason is. So just the word because can actually act as a trigger feature and this is true with, with business. And I mean, I'm just giving you an example of Xerox copies, but this, this idea of trigger feature really ha has tons of effects on the marketing industry. Uh, I mean, any kind of industry that you, that you think of. Um, by the way, this is not necessarily always a good thing, but it does, indicate or illustrate some effects that the that the that trigger features might have so let's take a look at some examples here and once again i know that there are nobody um I, I, in class right now necessarily but what i would usually do is i would have a student read this and you can look at the the words on the page and of course um, obviously a student would, would be able to, to read this and it doesn't matter necessarily what letters or what words are out of place. People can, can read this 
And the reason, if you look down here at the, at the bottom, is that our brain figures it out anyways. So for example, I don't know if anybody is a sports fan, but remember that back in, in 2007, West Virginia won the NIT basketball tournament. Not the NCAA, I mean, uh, I, I think that was, it was maybe UConn or I, I can't remember it exactly, but the NIT w was won by West Virginia. And what's, what's interesting about this is that the person who did the, uh, like the t-shirts at that time, misspelled Virginia. They actually spelled it as West Virginia, okay? Um, they forgot the, the, the third I that, that's supposed to go before the A there. And, uh, but the thing is, nobody realized it. In fact, if you look at the, at the reaction of the players, nobody realized that they had spelled it West Virginia instead of West Virginia. So, but the point though, is that our brains, going back to this, our brains figure out the words anyways, even if we don't necessarily read each letter by itself. And then also the same thing, by the way, if you're also a sports fan, happened with Washington and they didn't put, uh, or they didn't spell nationals correctly. It was the netnals. And of course, nobody realized it until after the fact. So that's also another um, example about trigger feature. And with trigger feature, another example that, that Cialdini gives is that they did a, a study in 1974 where they put these mother turkeys with their little infant turkeys. And the, the interesting thing about this is that when you put a mother turkey with her infants, even though she knows that they're there, if you put an audio of a, a like a polecat, which is their natural enemy, they instantly go into like attack mode. Uh, they don't necessarily kill their turkeys, their, their, their little infants, but it's an amazing reaction that they give just from listening to the audio of a polecat. So it just kind of goes to show that our trigger features are, are really, really, uh, in, in, I guess, important or are really reactive. Uh, they give uh, reactions. And so that's kind of interesting about uh, mother turkeys and, and polecats and just listening to the audio can have a huge effect on their behavior. So also, this is really interesting. So the lie detector test is meant to judge if you're lying or you're not. Uh, by, by the way, there is a reason that lie detectors are not used in court. They're, they're not uh, able to be used in, in court. The reason for that is that some people can kind of uh, can deceive the lie detector test and where other people that might be innocent maybe fail the lie detector test. But anyway, still, the point though with trigger feature is that lie detectors are supposed to be able to judge your reaction right away. So if you're lying, that needle is gonna go crazy and vice versa, if you're telling the truth, the needle is not going to go crazy, but that's the whole point, though, of, of uh, trigger feature and the lie detectors. But, but I mean, I, I think that's it's probably it, it's it's good for law enforcement to not necessarily use the lie detectors uh, because they can be very very easily uh, deceptive. So, anyways, though, the second bullet point here, though, 
is something that I know from personal experience, I know that students have told me this in your class or, uh, or I mean, the 1101 class, and I know that students have told me this, that this is absolutely true, that sometimes people walk into a store or a restaurant and they think, oh, well, if it's the most expensive item on the menu or the most expensive item in the store, it must be really, really good. And that's not really the, the case all the time. So one of the things that Cialdini says is that he knows somebody in Arizona, actually. Um, I, I think I mentioned Cialdini is from Arizona. He, he taught at Arizona State. In fact, uh, j just to kind of a timeout for a second, one of my professors at UCF was actually in the process of writing or co-writing a book with Cialdini. I don't, I have to talk to him. I, I don't, I don't know if that, I don't know if they are actually ever did it necessarily, but um, yeah, one of my professors at UCF was in the process of, in fact, that, that was actually uh, one of the things that I, I was surprised about when he mentioned this in class. And I'm like, hey, in my paper coming up, I'm citing Cialdini, and you're telling me that you're writing a book with him? Um, so that, that's kind of a side note there. But um, so Cialdini, though, one of his friends in Arizona, she was actually going out on a trip. I think she was going to Hawaii, I think, or, or a, a, you know, a different state. And it's kind of, and, and she was running the store. She was the, the manager or the CEO of a store. And she was having difficulty just getting rid of a piece of jewelry. I think it was a watch or something like that. And so just at, like, she wrote a bunch of notes for her employees. And one of the notes uh, was basically, you know, we're having trouble selling this watch, whatever. And she, she listed the prices that she just wanted to get rid of a lot of these, these items. And the person that read the note misinterpreted the price for this watch. So instead of uh, just marking it down from, I think it was like $15 to $5. She, the person who read the note thought it was is going to be marked up from, you know, $5, $5 to $50. Like she misinterpreted the decimal point. And it turns out that that item, that watch or that bracelet, whatever it may have been, ended up going through the roof in terms of sales because people said that, hey, well, if this is a $50 watch or a $50 bracelet, it must be really, really, really good. And um, so it was a total accident how that happened. But the point though is that Cialdini's friend <laughs> made a lot of a lot more money uh, just from the simple fact of misinterpreting or the person who who worked for her misinterpreted the the entire note, and then also the um, also uh, Chevelle Riquel, the Scotch whiskey company, they were almost out of going out of business in the 1990s and i th and basically their only sort of last ditch effort was to explain how oh well our our, our company is is really good and what did they do they just doubled their price for all the liquor stores that I know, I know that uh, um, 
the liquor companies are a little bit different from, from state to state, but essentially though, what Cheval Regal did is they essential is, is that they basically doubled their price. And sure enough, it turned out to be a huge business profit for them because people, once again, associated, hey, if this is a really uh, you know, excellent whiskey or if it costs a lot of money, it must be really good. They didn't really change any of their ingredients or anything like that, but people just associated it. Hey, if it's, if it's really expensive, it must be good, right? And then also the third bullet point here, Sid and Harry's tailor shop. Now, this is the story that I have to be honest, it's a little bit unethical. I wouldn't necessarily agree that stores would do this, but anyways, Sid and Harry used to have uh, like a suit shop, a tailor shop. And what they would do is that Sid would pretend to be deaf, so, or hard of hearing at least. And what he would do is that when a customer came in, he would pretend like he's having a little bit of difficulty hearing the customer. And so he would say to Harry, who, who's back in the shop, he would say, hey, hey, the customer wa wants, to, uh, wants to buy this suit. What is the price of this? Because what Sid and Harry would do is they would not have price tags on their, their, their suits. Or, or their, their clothing items. Um, so it would be kind of a thing where Sid or Harry would tell them. And then, so what Sid would do is that he would not have a price tag for the suit that he's trying to sell the customer. And he would yell back to, to Harry, hey, uh, what's the price for the suit? Because this customer wants to maybe buy it. And so Harry would yell back, okay, oh, no, 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 it, it's $700. And then Sid would, would tell the customer, oh, Harry just told me that it's, uh, I think it's $300. Would you like to buy it? And, and of course the customer would buy it because he or she is thinking that they're getting a really, really great deal. They think, oh, well, the, you know, Harry just said that it was $700 and now I'm getting a deal for 300. And I can just imagine how this happens all the time in the business world. Also, the, um, once again, the, the, this, it is actually proven to me by some students. If you work for Disney, Disney doesn't allow you to point with the finger. So if somebody asks, asks for directions, you have to point with two fingers or, or, or three fingers, whatever it might be. And it's kind of ridiculous to say, but I've actually had several students that uh, that have told me that this is absolutely true when disney or a lot of these theme parks when they train you when somebody asks for directions you have to point with two fingers or three fingers and the reason is is that in some countries remember that disney is a is a company that has you know tons of people from from international cultures and things like that. In some cultures, in some countries, if somebody was to point with one finger, say that, hey, this is where, uh, wh wh whatever it might be, uh, th th this is where the, the castle might be. If you point with one finger, then it is equivalent equivalent in some cultures to the middle finger. So that, <laughs> that's, that's, and that's true with all theme parks. They all uh, train you that if somebody asks for directions or for anything, you don't ever want to point with one finger because even though 
to us, it, it seems harmless. In some cultures, that's the equivalent of using the middle finger to, to somebody. And then also, just the last point here, the last bullet point here, with Citizen Kane, I'm not sure if that, once again, this is not a film class, so I don't want to get too bogged in, in, into this. But if you ever see Citizen Kane, you can always tell who the witness is, who, because if you've seen the movie, it's, it's, it's told in a, in a series of flashbacks, but you can always see who is having a flashback because they are always in the left foreground of the screen. And I mean, Citizen Kane is, is such a brilliant movie in, in so many ways. So I, I don't want to get too bogged into this because this is not a film class, but I mean, if we were having a film class, I could show you it, scene by scene how brilliant that film is. And, and Orson Welles, by the way, was only 25 years old when he directed that. And unfortunately, Orson had a kind of a history with, with the studios that they ended up censoring a lot of his, his films. I mean, Touch of Evil is one example of that, but also uh, a few other ones. Uh, the Magnificent Ambersons is another one. But anyways, this is not a film class, so I don't want to get too far into that. And one of the concept, concepts that we'll cover here today, I mean, I'm just looking at the, uh, we might not get too far beyond this today. What will also, I mean, I'm going to give you an extra, I guess, bonus session for maybe next, next week. But we'll talk a little bit about the contrast principle, because this is one of the things that Chaldean talks about. And the simple definition is that objects seem differently depending on what they are being compared to. Once again, what Chaldini says is that these are not rocket science concepts. They're just things that people forget to remember, whether we're, we're talking about marketing or you know, advertising or uh, just in general. And so he, he talks about how you have done studies or there, there have been studies where people have, for instance, for example, uh, a pail of water and it's really, really heavy. And then they also have an empty pail in their left hand. So they have like a pail of water in their right hand and they have an empty pail in their left hand. And of course, obviously the pail in the right hand is going to be really, really heavy. But the interesting thing for psychologists is that when people do this experiment and then they're giving two different objects that are the same weight, the object in their right hand seems a lot different than the object in their left hand. It, it, just is an illustration of how the compare contrast principle, the contrast principle really makes a difference in terms of how people think that they're weighing two different objects. Also, okay, so <laughs> the third bullet point here, I just want to emphasize this because this is something that, once again, students that ha have told me that this, this is absolutely 1,000% true. Cialdini talks about this. He gives some examples in his book. But students that have worked in real estate tell me that this is 1,000% true. That sometimes in real estate, when you go to buy a house or a condo, the person that's trying to sell you the house or condo will completely overprice 
the you know the value of the the, the condo or the the house and their goal is not to tell you the the, the real price of the place that they're trying to sell you uh, they do it it's, it's called a setup house where they'll take you to one place and they know damn well that you're not going to buy this it's going to seem overpriced their real goal though is to sell you the next house or the next condo which is still probably going to be overpriced but it's it's not going to seem as overpriced and it's it's uh once again it's comparing and contrast they want you to remember the overpriced house or condo that they try to sell you and then their goal though is to sell you the next house which is still going to be again probably overpriced but compared to the last place it's it's not necessarily going to uh seem so overpriced and also I'll tell you what, the, this last bullet point here, I'll, I'll save that for, for next week. There, there's an example that Cialdini cited his own student who wrote a letter to their, their parents. Um, but um, I'll tell you what, we'll save that for, um, for next week. And... and I'll tell you what, we'll kind of end things. I know that a lot of people are not really here today, but I, they'll, they'll catch it on the, uh, on the replay or on the YouTube, which I'll, I'll post up. But we'll hopefully have more of these, I guess, bonus sessions, maybe on Fridays. And, and of course, obviously for this week, I want to make sure that you are paying attention to the instructions for the, the paper. Remember, I, I know I don't have to, to worry about too many of you, but remember that <laughs> don't plagiarize. If you try to use something from a different class or something that you did before, the system is going to pick it up. And also if you try to cite anything from, from Wikipedia, trust me, I'll be able to, to pick it up quickly so but I, I know I know that I don't have to worry about pretty much I don't think I have to worry about anybody so so I'm just going to end this for today remember it will be awesome if we can have more of these bonus sessions on Fridays and remember that I'll always post these on YouTube and uh, just a reminder too, I've, I've, I've talked to the NZN and I've talked to my, my professor from, from UCF and he's totally on board. So it's just a matter of um, if, if I can see if, if Seminole can get funding. And to be honest, the NZN gave me a, a, a price that Seminole would pay. And to be it's it's totally reasonable so i think that this this could happen you know it's it's always great if if i could see you guys in person and of course we'll have to you know obviously we'll, we'll social distance and everything like that but it would be awesome to to meet you guys face to face and then also if you want to take my 1102 class next semester that that would be awesome as well uh, unfortunately, I, I just read that uh, probably next semester it's gonna it's gonna be all online again for a lot of colleges. I mean, the vaccine it, it's it's coming, but it just it it seems that not everybody might have access to it uh, by the start of next semester. So we, we would have to probably have class online again next semester but you know what that that's just one of the things that we have to deal with but i thank everybody for attending for today and we'll meet again monday